Um, there was one thing that I did not mention, did not talk about on Friday when we talked about the doctrine of Christ that I, that's very important and I want to go back and pick up. I just didn't get to it. And the reason I wanted to pick it up is because the most common misperception or misrepresentation that people have about Jesus, who is the Christ, has to do with people who say, well, Jesus was a really good teacher and a really great man. And if we all were more like him, the world would be a better place. But I don't really believe he's God. That's the most common mistake people make. It is the most common. I have heard it since I moved to Mexico. I've heard it half a dozen times. And um, that is the one thing that is unacceptable to Christianity. Someone who says that cannot be a Christian. Because to be a Christian means to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, not just a good teacher. Paul said if you... Um, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, meaning you will be a Christian. Um, and I want to read you the best, uh, the best response to that question or that statement that I've ever heard um, is from C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. If you don't know this book, if you don't own this book, then first chance you get, get it. Um, I mean, I've, I've used this book more than any other book I've ever, ever known of other than the Bible. <laughs> And it's the second most important book, as far as I'm concerned, that's ever been written in Christianity. And I'm serious about that. Mm. Uh, it is without, without peer, other than Scripture, in terms of being a, a very intelligent, understandable, but meaningful explanation of, uh, the God, of Christianity. This is the book that converted Charles Colson to Christianity and a lot of others. Okay? I want to read you this section. and he's, uh, in, in the first part of this, uh, C.S. Lewis has been talking about the fact that um, that people have some sense of a right and wrong. He's talked about this idea of a moral compass that nobody can explain where it came from unless there is some, some divine source. He's also been talking historically about the nature of the Jewish people and God calling the Jewish people and God's interacting with humanity in that way. And I want to pick up here, um, this is a chapter called What Christians Believe. And he's been talking about the Jews and he says this, then comes the real shock. Among these Jews, there suddenly turns up a man who goes about talking as if he were God. He claims to forgive sins. He says he has always existed. He says he is coming to judge the world at the end of time. Now let's get this clear. Among pantheists, like the Indians, you know, remember what pantheism is, it means believing that all, everything all added up together is God. Panentheism means everything all added up together plus some means God. So among, uh, among pantheists like the Indians, anyone might say he was a part of God or one with God. There would be nothing very odd about that. But this man, since he was a Jew, could not mean that kind of God. God, in their language, meant the being outside the world who had made it and was infinitely different from anything in it. And when you have grasped that, you will see that what this man said was quite simply the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by human lips. One part of that claim tends to slip past us unnoticed because we've heard it so often that we no longer see what it amounts to. And I've, I've referred to this. I mean the claim to forgive sins. Any sins. Now, unless the speaker is God, that is really so preposterous as to be comic. We can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself. You tread on my toe, and I forgive you. You steal my money, and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man, himself unrobbed and untrodden on, who announces that he forgave you for treading on other men's toes and stealing other men's money? Asinine fatuity is the kindest description that uh, we should find for such a conduct. Yet this is what Jesus did. He told people that their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult all the other people whom their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitatingly it behaved as if he were the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. This makes sense only if he really was the God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the mouth of any speaker who is not God, those words would imply what I can only regard as a silliness and a conceit unrivaled by any other character in history. Yet, and this is the strange <clears throat> significant thing, even his enemies, when they read the Gospels, do not usually get the impression of silliness or conceit. Still less do unprejudiced readers. Jesus, uh, Jesus says that he is humble and meek, and we believe him. 
not noticing that if he were merely a man, humbleness and meekness would be the very last characteristics we could attribute to some of his sayings. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil from hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Okay. Um, what, what page is, it, is that? Um, well, it's... Uh, I'm the same little books. Yeah, 54 to 56. Okay. okay. Um, the whole book is like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I uh, really do recommend it to you. Um, people who say... Jesus is a great moral teacher, Jesus was a great man, but he wasn't God, either have never bothered to read about Jesus, and they're, they're just parroting something that somebody told them once, or they've never really thought about anything seriously. Because that is not an acceptable response to Jesus. You either reject him completely, because he's either insane or, or evil, a demon, trying to, trying to fool us, or else you accept him for what he was. But there is no middle ground. Jesus said, I come to divide, you know, families even, because you have to decide yes or no with Jesus. You can't just say, oh yeah, he's a, you know, me, me and Jesus, we're mates. He's a good guy. I like him. That's not an option. Okay? You have to make a choice. He either was God or you need to reject him completely. And Lewis, Lewis is only one of the people that's done a good job with that, but I think he's one of the best. I, I believe that we put ourselves above him by saying he's a good moral teacher. And I'll take some of what he says and I'll choose what I like. Yeah. And he's not going to tell me how to run my life. I am still in charge here. Exactly. I, won't, I won't allow him to be God because if he's truly God, then I've got to answer to him. Right. It, it's, you're exactly right. We decide that we are the arbiters of what's true and we can accept or reject that. Um, the same thing with people, people who say, well, you know, I just, I don't, I don't like God. I don't like the things he does. I, well, okay, then you've decided that you are the one who makes the decision about what is right and true and good in the universe and not God. Um, okay. <laughs> um, good luck with that. Let's see how that works out for you. Yes. Go ahead. Um, through all your years of ministry, when people come and they say, well, all you end up is being dirt. You're just dust in the end. There's nothing after that. Um, how... Uh, I, I can't wrap my mind around the fact that there could be nothing after. Do they do they change uh, when there's something frightening that happens to them, uh, illness or something? Or you mean what causes them to think that way? That there is no there's no spiritual, there is no eternal. Right, and then and then when there is something so serious, <clears throat> do they do they come up? Do they, do they are they now open to? receiving the word or well I think a great many people are affected by serious events in their lives to the point that they're more open to the spiritual that's why they say there are no atheists in the foxholes <clears throat> you know, when either your life or the life of someone you care about is threatened or even in the case of a loved one ends frequently people have to confront the spiritual reality and some some confront it and, and accept and some confront it and reject completely by blaming God or whatever um, I think that for the most part, people who say, well, I believe that, you know, when you die, you're just, you're worm food, and that's all there is to it, and you're gone. For the most part, those are people who have listened to the wrong opinions. They're people who have been taught by teachers, by parents, by friends, by somebody, that uh, that falsehood. And it's amazing that as many people accept that as due, because there is inherent in the human being a sense in which we are not just going to be worm food. You know, there is a... There is, there is a sense of the eternal in every person. And you have to be truly blinded by cynicism or 
false teaching or something to be complete to be willing to completely set aside what I believe is inherent in every person the fact that it's inherent in every person is why we have to date never identified any cultures throughout all of human history that have had not had some sort of religious belief every culture in history has had some idea that there is something bigger than us that there is a God or there are angelic beings or there are spiritual beings or there is an afterlife or there is something Go back as far as you want in terms of any knowledge that we have. The most ancient of cultures, the Sumerian culture, the Egyptian culture, the Indo-European cultures, you know, that began in the Indus River Valley, all of them are deities. Well, how can we look at the entire known history of all humanity and say that there has never been a culture that doesn't have some sense of the divine and think that we're smarter than everybody who's ever lived and we're smart, we're so smart we're going to reject all that. Um, and I've, I've said before, at least in sermons, I don't know if I've said it here, that the other thing that We've never found a culture that has not, never found a culture that hasn't had religion, and we've also never found a culture that didn't have some sense that there was something wrong with us. That humanity has something broken in us, something that needs to be healed. Well, Christianity, Judaism, and Christianity explain what that is our separation from God. So, people who insist on that, I think it's because they have listened to the wrong teaching. Uh, in some cases, people are cynical because they, they maybe have been hurt a little. Most people who've been hurt a lot struggle you know, to find meaning in that and often do come back to that. But it's almost as though every individual is different. Okay. okay. I want to spend the next 40 minutes talking about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> uh, because the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit can lead us to truth. My apologies again for not having the overhead. We, uh, overhead, we will have that PowerPoint and stuff up and available to you. Um, first, I want to remind you, when we talked about the doctrine of God earlier, we identified that God is Trinity. The basic definition of the doctrine of God as Trinity is first that God exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Second, that every one of those three persons is fully God. And third, yet there is one God. That is the Trinity. Three persons making up one God. And I use the analogy of you know a person, myself, who has a, a, a mind that is the controlling force, there is a soul that is uh, the seat of personality that responds to things that are not, not necessarily uh, rational, that are not cognitive, you know, honor, love, loyalty, you know, beauty, and then there is the physical body. So every, I think one of the ways we're made in the image of God is that we are tripartite, we are of three parts. And frequently, instead of mind, we may call it a soul, because the soul, the expression when they use the soul, usually that means the part of us that is able to relate to uh, other human beings. The part of us that has personality, in other words. And we talked about, when we talked about the, I don't remember which class it was, probably the doctrine of God, that if the soul truly is the part of us that has a personality that relates to other beings, <coughs> earthly beings, then that's why we may perceive th that ability in animals. But then there is spirit, which is the part of us that is able to relate to God. All right? And then the Holy Spirit comes into that. But again, the point is the Trinity, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And unless you're a part of a charismatic church, the one who almost never gets talked about is the Holy Spirit. And yet, there is no distinction in power or significance or deity or divinity or anything else between any of the persons of the Trinity. The only difference between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is how they relate to each other and to creation. We talked about that under the doctrine of God. And you remember we had the... The beautiful diagram, which I had again in the PowerPoint that is now still at home, about God in the center, and you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father is God, Son is God, Holy Spirit is God, but Father is not Son, Father is not Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is not Son. Okay, that, that there are separations in the persons, but unity in the Godhead. Now, that's the first thing for us to recognize, is that the Holy Spirit is God. He is part of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is as divine as God the Father or God the Son. Now, take a half step back and say, when you look at Christian expression, that is Christian belief, and how people experience their faith as believers, there is a tendency, a human tendency, to, to uh, fall into one or the other extreme. Either we tend to be too subjective, Meaning we're so oriented toward how does it feel and the emotional part of it. I mean, that's why so many churches spend 90% of their service singing worship songs, because that makes them feel good. Um, I have nothing against worship songs. 
but there is very little propositional truth associated with that. You know, it is all subjective, meaning what do I experience? On the, and, and you know, for many, and I've said this before, I'm not against charismatic renewal or Pentecostal churches, but the, I've known a number of people who were Pentecostal that were so oriented toward that experience <coughs> that their whole drive was to, to the next experience of the spiritual, rather than a, 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 the recognition that there also is propositional truth. There is doctrine. Well, the other, sometimes people fall into the very dry camp where it's all propositional truth. It's all doctrine that they learn. It's all what they think about the faith and accept cognitively about the faith without the sense in which they have a spiritual, you know, that, that they don't have an experiential aspect of it. They do not experience the divine. Their faith is a dry cognitive faith and doesn't involve their heart. Now, both of those extremes uh, fall short of God's desire for us. Jesus, in a very real way, when he came to earth, the historical facts of Jesus' sacrifice for us constitute propositional truths for us to understand. You know, the, I said last week that the most important aspect of Christianity, sort of the, the, the thing that makes or breaks the Christian faith, is what do we say about Jesus? What is the propositional truth we accept about Jesus? That we, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's a propositional truth. We believe in our heart God has raised him from the dead. You know, we read the stories and we say, you know, we believe that's true. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us the correct balance. It especially is the Holy Spirit that allows us to have a subjective sense of faith. The Holy Spirit, whereas Jesus came and gave us a historical set of events around which we develop our propositional truths and doctrines, it is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, the third person of the Trinity, that makes this mean something more to us than just historical facts. Okay? And so the Holy Spirit living in us is God's plan for how it is we are supposed to experience faith in our hearts as well as in our minds. Okay? It's not either or, it's both and. We should experience the faith in an objective way via propositional truths, and in a subjective way in terms of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. Now, um, R.A. Torrey, uh, one of the issues that we run into as we, as we study about the Holy Spirit, as we read about it, a lot of people have a tendency to think of the Holy Spirit not as a person. A person is a being that has a will and a uh, personality and has a mind, a knowledge. There's a tendency, and I think it may be because he doesn't have a name, we have a tendency to think of the Holy Spirit as a force rather than as a person. And people who think of the Holy Spirit as a force are seeking to access that force <laughs> to apply to their lives in some way. And Scripture actually has, has examples of that. We have the story in the book of Acts about Simon the Magician, who apparently really was a Christian, because it says he had come to faith in Christ, but when he saw the, the disciples performing miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit, he said, I want that power. Can I, can I purchase from you the ability to do such miraculous things by the power of the Spirit? And of course, Simon Peter uh, replied, Your silver perished with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither uh, part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours. Pray to God that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Now, it was the Holy Spirit that was working through Peter and the other <coughs> apostles to do those miracles. And Simon Peter had the attitude of, what can I do? Can I pay you to get access to that power, to that force? On the other hand, we have examples where, in Scripture, where the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit is the one who is... Uh, using us and accessing us. It's not a matter of the people using the Holy Spirit as a force, but the Holy Spirit using the people as his outlet. An example of that, again, in Acts 13, when the Holy Spirit said to the, the people in Antioch, set aside for me, the Holy Spirit, Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them to. So a big part of the difference is, is how do we think of the Holy Spirit? We first have to think of him as a person, not simply a force. And if we recognize that, it changes our whole attitude. There's one analogy that I read, a, a guy who'd been teaching about the Holy Spirit and the nature of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit indwelling our lives. And after the talk, a woman came up to him and said, you know, 
this is a complete revelation to me. I never really thought about it being like that. <laughs> it being the Holy Spirit. And he's, the, the guy said his response was, of course, that she apparently didn't get it. <laughs> because it instead of he, uh, you know, the male pronoun is used, but that the Holy Spirit is a person. So that's the first thing. R.A. Torrey, a great spiritual writer, wrote this. If we once grasp the thought that the Holy Spirit is a divine person of infinite majesty and glory and holiness and power, who is mar who in marvelous condescension has come into our hearts to make his abode there and take possession of our lives and make use of them, it will put us in the dust and keep us in the dust, meaning we'll be humbled by it. I can think of no thought more humbling or more overwhelming than the thought that a person of divine majesty and glory dwells in my heart and is ready to use even me. Now you can't think of it that way if the Holy Spirit is an it to you, if it's a force. We have to have a sense that the Spirit is a person with a mind, a personality, a will, in the same way that Jesus is. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point, which I've already mentioned that we always have to lock down, is that the Holy Spirit is God in every way that, Father, that the Father and Son is God. The Holy Spirit is co-equal, co-eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He is the third person of the Trinity in equality, and He deserves every honor that we offer to God, the Father or God the Son. Um, J.I. Packer, who I had the great blessing to be a student of, Packer writes this about the Holy Spirit and us honoring Him as God. He said, do we honor the Holy Spirit by recognizing and relying on His work? Or do we slight Him by ignoring it and therefore dishonor, not merely the Spirit, but the Lord who sent Him? We dishonor all of God when we dishonor the Holy Spirit. And, and here's one for you. In our faith, do we acknowledge the authority of the Bible, the prophetic Old Testament, and the apostolic New Testament, which He, the Holy Spirit, inspired? Do we read and hear it with the reverence and receptiveness that are due to the Word of God? If not, we dishonor the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought about that? When we don't take this, the Word of God, Scripture, seriously, or when we say, oh, well, you know, I don't like that part, so I'm not going to listen to that part. We are dishonoring God by dishonoring the Holy Spirit who inspired those words. Um, we need to know and understand that the Holy Spirit deserves full honors and worship because He is God. Okay. Now, the Holy Spirit has certain responsibilities. In addition to being a person, the Holy Spirit also um, has certain works. We talk about in our definition of the Trinity that the only difference between the three persons of the Trinity is a difference in how they relate to one another, meaning that there is a subordination that occurs, not because one's more powerful, but because you know, the Son and the Holy Spirit choose to subordinate themselves to the Father. Uh, but also in terms of particular responsibilities. They each have their assignments. Well, the Holy Spirit acts to provide us with the call of God. We would not hear the voice of God apart from the Holy Spirit touching our hearts. Okay? Um, and He then gives us the ability to accept that call in faith. He continues to give us active and con in, um, a continuing process of justification, meaning we are saved by an act of the Holy Spirit when we receive Jesus Christ. We're told that it is the sacrifice of Christ, but that we receive that, the salvation, the justification that comes from that, as it is applied to us by the Holy Spirit, Scripture says. So Jesus' act gives us access to salvation, but we actually can achieve that or, or receive that by an act of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit assists us in justification, in regeneration, making us whole again, making us new again, in sanctification, making us holy, and ultimately in glorification, preparing us for the presence of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is active in doing all of those things continually. Jesus' sacrifice was once for all. The act of the Holy Spirit is ongoing in us. Every day I need the renewal and the reactivation of the Holy Spirit in my life to receive all of the blessings and benefits that He gives me. My justification is assured, my salvation. But the regeneration, the sanctification, all of those sorts of things, the comfort and all the things that the Holy Spirit gives are things I need to and can access all the time. And so when we think about the Holy Spirit, uh, John Calvin in the third section of, of the Institutes, which is about the Spirit and the Spirit's work, 
He said that the study of the Holy Spirit is a study of, and this is a quote, the way in which we receive the grace of Christ, that application of justification to us, what benefits come to us from it, that we can be sanctified, made holy, comforted, taught, all of those things, and what effects follow. How does that change both us, the church, and the world? All of those are parts of the Holy Spirit's work. So um, let's talk about the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm not going to jump on Wayne Gruden this week, but um, there, he does suggest in his writings about the Holy Spirit, Wayne Gruden does, that some people have said that the Holy Spirit uh, isn't concerned about his own glory, but only the glory of Jesus. Well, literally, I think that's true. The, the Holy, and he says that's not true. He says, no, the Holy Spirit's concerned about himself being recognized as God as well. I don't disagree with the literal sense of that. But the primary responsibility, according to Scripture, that the Holy Spirit has, the primary job of the Holy Spirit, is to glorify Christ. That's why the Holy Spirit is active, is to glorify Christ, not to glorify himself. It's true that the Holy Spirit is a personality, and the Holy Spirit is deserving of honor and glory, and the Holy Spirit is active in being, in, and is recognized as active in Scripture. But the primary job of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ. Now, the first way that he does that, he glorifies Christ by having inspired the writings of the Old Testament and the New Testament to witness to and teach us about Christ. Why did the Holy Spirit inspire the writing of Scripture? Well, what's the theme of Scripture? The theme of the Old Testament is God's promise of becoming Messiah. It all really boils down to that. Everything else is about that. You know, that God called his people, and from the very start, he said, there will come a time of perfection when I will send my Messiah to you. And that's been the expectation of the Jewish people all along. And then, of course, the New Testament is the story of the arrival and, and life on earth of Jesus, and then an expanded understanding of that through the epistles. So... The Holy Spirit, by inspiring the prophets to write the Old Testament and the apostolic um, leaders, apostles, and those who were approved by the apostles to write the New Testament, he did so to witness to and to teach us about Christ. Two scripture verses that say that to us. 2 Peter 1.21 says this, For prophecy, and that means all of the writing of the Word of God. You know, the, remember, prophecy doesn't mean telling the future. It means giving the Word of God to people. The writing of the word is, uh, is the major act of prophetic uh, uh, discourse. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, through human, uh, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit caused the writing of the Scripture. That's the, the doctrine of inspiration. John 14, 26 and 27 says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this is Jesus talking, will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit acts to provide witness and teaching about Christ. And Jesus said he will, he will remind you of everything I've said and teach you all things. So that's the Holy Spirit's job. But that job is related to glorifying Jesus. A second way that the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ is by drawing men and women to him, by drawing us to Jesus. John 16, again Jesus saying, Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. So the Holy Spirit's job with regard to sin and righteousness and judgment, and that passage continues. I shortened it because I have it, because it won't fit on the overhead slide, uh, the PowerPoint slide. Uh, the idea is that the Holy Spirit's job was to convict people of their sin in order to have them see their need and therefore to be drawn to Christ. That's why he said uh, about sin, because people do not believe in me. It makes them aware of the fact they need to believe in Jesus. Okay? Um, the third way in which Jesus glorifies Christ, as I flip through my many pages of notes on the this year, is that he glorifies Christ by reproducing the character of Christ in Christian people. We are to become more Christ-like. That's what it means to become more godly, is to be more like Jesus. Well, the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ by reproducing Christ's character 
He does it by leading Christians to greater victory over themselves and sin. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength and the ability and the motivation even to, to seek to not sin. Secondly, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in prayer and he teaches us to pray. Um, Paul says that we know not how to pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us in words deeper than we can understand. So literally the Holy Spirit prays for us and the Holy Spirit teaches us to pray. And the Holy Spirit, third, reveals God's will and enables us to walk in that will. So the way in which the Holy Spirit produces Christ's character in us, he leads us to victory over sin and over our own inclinations. Secondly, he intercedes for us in prayer and teaches us to pray. And third, he reveals God's will and enables us to walk in it. He tells us what it is God wants of us. Okay. So, the Holy Spirit's job is to glorify Christ, first, by inspiring the teaching of the Old and New Testament that witness to Jesus. Second, by drawing men and women to Jesus. Third, by reproducing the character of Christ in those who are his followers. And the fourth way that the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ by directing Christians uh, in Christ uh, in Christians is that he directs Christians to service. He doesn't just lead us to Jesus and then, as we accept Christ, apply the justification made available to us. Um, he then gives us the ability to live as Jesus' followers in this world by equipping us with gifts. This is what the whole gifts of the Holy Spirit are about. Um, 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. It means the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to us to serve for us to be able to serve the body of Christ, and to some extent, the community at large in the world. Um, to one there is given the spirit of the message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, and it goes on to the various of the gifts. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each just as he determines. So the Holy Spirit's primary job is to glorify Jesus by teaching us and, uh, about him, witnessing to him, drawing us and men and women everywhere to him, making us aware of our need, and making us aware of the truth of the gospel. When someone hears the gospel spoken or the gospel preached, and for the first time they say, I believe that's true. I believe that's right. No one can say that except by the Holy Spirit's actions in them. Because without the Holy Spirit telling us that that's true, Scripture says it is a kind of folly. It says their eyes are darkened. We are unable to see the truth except that the Holy Spirit makes it available to us. That's why you can never argue anybody into the kingdom of God. There's nothing you can do to get somebody saved other than be an example to them, be available to talk with them when they ask, but mostly be in prayer that the Holy Spirit would touch their heart. So many times I've had people come to me in classes I have and, and say, I have an aunt who's not a Christian and i got to do something to get her saved. What can I do? I said, well, first, don't be obnoxious about it. <laughs> don't drive her away. Love her. Pray for her. Be available to her when the time is right. But most, most, most important of all, pray that the Holy Spirit would act to touch her heart so that she would hear the message. So that she would see your life and know that there's something about your life that, that she wants to know more about, for instance. But apart from that, no one can be saved. No one can be drawn to Christ unless the Holy Spirit draws them and convinces them of that truth. Um, he glorifies Christ by reproducing his character. He glorifies Christ by calling us to service. Now, there are a number of other um, activities that the Holy Spirit has responsibility for. We are told that the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, which I've already uh, referred to. He justifies by applying the justification to us. He intercedes for us. That's the part about he prays for us and teaches us to pray. He teaches us. So many of the things that we seek to learn about the faith, we are only able to really understand. It, it only meshes for us. It only fits together as the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to understand it. Again, to the world, Scripture says it's a kind of foolishness. My preaching mentor in seminary, Ian Pitt Watson, uh, he wrote a book on preaching that's called A Kind of Folly, which is one's translation of the verse that says to the world, this is, this is foolishness. People do not see you... It, I, I have people all the time saying to me, how can people be so blind? Well, because they are blind. Human beings are naturally spiritually blind, and we cannot see the truth 
unless the Holy Spirit opens our heart and our mind and our eyes and teaches us that it's true. Um, he renews us every day. We have the renewal of the Holy Spirit. He strengthens us. He gives us the ability to, to uh, be strong in the face of opposition and illness and everything else. He gives us gifts, as we talked about, and ultimately, again, he presents Christ to us. So those are some of the aspects in which the Holy Spirit is responsible. But most, the, the major points I want you to come away with is the Holy Spirit is a person, as Jesus is a person. He is not, he's not a force. I've sometimes thought we should give, Jesus, uh, give the Holy Spirit a name. I mean, we've got Jesus, you know, it's a name. And God the Father, we sort of, Father is kind of a name for many of us, you know, to refer to Father, Dad, Abba, whatever. But the Holy Spirit just sounds so formal. And, and there's no name for it. Of course, it would probably be blasphemy to give him a name. But um, I, I think that we at least need to have the sense in which the Holy Spirit is as much a person in the sense that he could, he could very well have a name. Maybe someday we'll be told he does. I don't know. But um, so the, the idea is he is fully God. He is a person, not a force, that he has, he has certain responsibilities, the primary one of which is to glorify Christ. Okay. And then it's, it's, he is the one that makes, that is the connection that fits us into all of that. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit in us that makes us both understand and participate in the work of God in the world. Without the Holy Spirit, the best we would have are propositional truths about historical events that happened with Jesus. Because we would not be able to access the salvation that's made available in Christ's sacrifice on the cross apart from the Holy Spirit making it available to us and applying the justification to our hearts and then growing us in godliness. Okay. Um, any questions about any of that? Yes? Is the name Yahweh, does the name Yahweh convey plurality like uh, Elohim? No. Yahweh actually is singular. I am who I am or it, it's a legitimate translation to say I, uh, I will be who I will be. There's a, there's a, uh, it's more than just a present tense. So it does not have pluralism in, in, built into it. But the typical word for God, Elohim, is a plural word. Um, and so all through scripture, when it refers to, to God as God, which is Elohim, um, that is a plural word. And of course, we have other, a lot of other instances where, where, like, let us make man in our own image. Well, God is not talking to the angels there, because the angels are not... We're not made the image of the angels. That was not the plan. God is speaking, in effect, to himself, but because he is three persons, then... Uh, and, and it's also true, there, there are a lot of other pieces of that. Um, when we say God is love, what does that mean? Does it mean God is loving? It actually means that inherent, built into God, is, is love. Because built into God, there are three persons that are in relationship, that are in loving relationship. So, so by, by the very nature of his existence, now, how God is, there is love that occurs between the three persons that are all together part of the one God. Right? So when we say God is love, we quite literally mean He is love, that love is inherent in Him. And that is then the source of all love that we know, because it's, it's one of His attributes, that He is a, love, a God of love because He is a multiple person God that, is, that has love existing between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bob, did you have your hand up? Uh, I think a God may have another question. Uh, first of all, I'm a Presbyterian Methodist. Okay. Um, but my comment is, uh, I get the feeling from some of my Pentecostal friends that they think the main job of the Holy Spirit is to make you speak in tongues. <clears throat> and my question is, uh, what are we to make of the statement of Jesus that uh, unless I go away, the Holy Spirit can't come to you? Right. <clears throat> well, and I, I read that, you know, we, we use the word advocate in a particular translation, but that's who he's talking about. In some, some translations, they use the word comforter. The comforter will come, because that's one of the words for the capital C, or capital A for advocate, that we use for the Holy Spirit. Um, the idea that Jesus, when he was alive in the presence of his apostles and disciples, that he was teaching them, he was leading them and guiding them. When he said, he actually said, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I go away, then the Comforter will come. The idea being that when Jesus was, and, and, and 
and the words that he actually uses, it's interesting, that he says, another will come. Now, there's two Greek words for another. One of them is uh, heteros, like heterodox. It means completely different than, okay? Another completely different one. That's not the word that they use here. The word that Jesus uses for another will come is the word aios. And that means another like the first one. The, the very choice of that word means another like me. Another who is part of the Godhead. A divine one will come to comfort you. And whereas Jesus, since I believe in the kenosis uh, doctrine, that Jesus, during his time on earth, chose to be in one place at one time. He was not omnipresent. When he said, it will be better for you, it's because the Holy Spirit actually indwells us. It goes with us everywhere we are. It is not necessary for us to be in the physical presence of the earthly Jesus, which is the context in which he was speaking about that. But rather, the Holy Spirit is in us constantly, comforting us, teaching us, encouraging us, strengthening us, renewing us in a way that Jesus, even in his earthly presence, did not do. You know, Jesus came and taught, and he acted to save us. But all of that gets applied to us by the Holy Spirit in a much more direct and even intimate way than the experience of Jesus. Okay? So that's why he said another, Ios, will come, the Comforter will come, and it will be better for you because we have an intimacy with the Holy Spirit that would not be available even if Jesus, to us even if Jesus were alive today. That's why the disciples so often misunderstood Jesus. They just didn't get it. And, and, you know, several times Jesus had to say, are you guys still that thick? that you don't get it yet, well, the Holy Spirit speaks into us in a way that, you know, we do understand it. We do get it if we're willing to hear. John? Two comments. Um, we're talking about um, how the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ. And this probably, what I'm about to say, could be incorporated in the point where you're talking about him drawing men and women to Christ. But then again, I think it's distinct. And that namely is, he glorifies Christ by revealing him. Mm -hmm. Nobody recognized him. Isaiah said he had nothing that would draw attention to himself in the physical world. John the Baptist didn't even recognize him until the day he was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove over him. And, and I, I know the Holy Spirit works in us to draw him to them, but at the same time I think at, at the same moment he peels back the layers and lets us see Christ as the Messiah, and that's only by revelation. That's, right. that's one point that I'm going to make. And the other thing is, if the Holy Spirit loves Jesus as much as he indicates in his scripture by pointing us all of creation to the Son of God, then how much more should we love Christ and be focused on Right. I, I completely agree. That is the message the Holy Spirit gives us. And you're right. It, it's... You can almost see a sequential process by which the Holy Spirit affects us. First, the Holy Spirit um, convicts us of our own failing, our own sin. Makes us aware that I'm not okay. Then, as we, are, as we have presentations of the truth of Jesus to us, and I think the Holy Spirit leads us to those. Okay? Too many examples of people walking down the street and they just hear something. You know, that they're led to the truth of the gospel. Um, that, that, the, that when we are led to presentations of the truth of Christ, it is only by the Holy Spirit that our blinded eyes are unscaled. In other words, we would not be able, except by the Holy Spirit, to hear the truth for what it is, to see the truth for what it is. Uh, and so, yes, it is the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to perceive and understand that. Otherwise, it is foolishness. We are blinded. We, our hearts are hardened. It is the Holy Spirit that allows that. And then once we are given that ability to perceive the truth of Christ, and we say yes to it, we immediately have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't, intentionally did not get into the gifts of the Spirit here, your, your uh, Presbyterian method, that uh, Pentecostalist back there, whatever it was. <laughs> uh, we have groups in our church that we call them the Lutheranians, because they're Lutheran background, but now they're part of the Presbyterian Church, so they're Lutheranians. Um, the... the um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, everyone has available to them the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is not distributed individually. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, etc. 
Those are available to all Christians by the Holy Spirit giving us those things in our lives. And the more that we allow the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives, then the more we are going to illustrate or, or uh, express those fruit in our lives. Someone has said in terms of giving the Holy Spirit control, it's sort of like driving the car. There are some people who, are drive, who would drive a car and the Holy Spirit is not welcome as, even as a passenger. Then there are some who say, well, sure, Holy Spirit, you can ride in the back. And then at a certain point in their maturity, they say, well, why don't you ride up front and help navigate? But true maturity in the Spirit is to say, how about you drive? And I'll ride. So that you, because you know where we should go better than I do. Okay. And so that idea of growing and allowing the Holy Spirit to direct us, the more we grow in Him, the more the fruit of the Holy Spirit will be shown. Now, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that's not true. Not everyone has all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit are you know, prophecy, teaching, uh, healing, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, hospitality, on and on and on. You know, there's, there's two and sort of three different lists of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are not exactly the same. The indication being that the Holy Spirit will provide gifting to people as it is needed for the sake of, you know, for the common good, for the sake of the body. There is, to my mind, no clear indication, in fact, quite the contrary, there's, there's, there's indication that it is not necessary to speak in tongues to demonstrate you have the Holy Spirit. There are several cases where when the Holy Spirit came upon people, like the Gentiles in Antioch, for instance, um, they, they were led by the Spirit to speak in tongues. Well, I think the very simple reason is that speaking in tongues is the most visible the most evident from the outside example of the gifts of the Spirit. It would be very hard for somebody to demonstrate immediately the gift of hospitality in such a way that people can't deny it. Or the gift of administration. Or even the gift of teaching. You know, uh, Whereas the gift of, the, of tongues is so dramatic and so unexpected that everyone who sees that says the Holy Spirit is present there. And that's why when it was particularly important to demonstrate that, that people had been accepted, they, they professed Christ and it was real and it was sincere and God had accepted them and given them the Holy Spirit, why they spoke in tongues. There are too many places in which Paul particularly says that speaking in tongues is not the end all and be all of the spiritual experience. Paul even says, does everyone prophesy? Does everyone speak in tongues? Does it? And, and clearly the answer is no, because He's trying to make the point that God gives the gifts as he decides, as he, the Holy Spirit, decides. Not everyone has all the gifts. <clears throat> the, to take the examples where people speak in tongues to demonstrate the presence of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, in Acts especially, and to say that that then gets transferred so that everyone needs to speak in tongues in order to show that they have the Holy Spirit, simply is, is jumping too far. That's not necessary, and there are clearly verses that indicate that that not, should not be the case. Um, it's not that I don't believe in speaking in tongues. I believe the gifts are for today as much as they were then. And it is to the detriment of the church that we don't experience the practice of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all of them, more than we do. Okay, so I'm not being anti-gifts of the Holy Spirit when I say that. I just do not think Scripture justifies saying speaking in tongues is the mark. And Carolyn, there was an older woman who, who was in our church, and she passed away a couple years ago. And she and Carolyn had this... I, I tell these stories over and over. I'm sorry if you heard this, but um, she and Carolyn had this this good-hearted back and forth any number of times, where she would say to my wife Carolyn, "Carolyn, I so wish you had the Holy Spirit." Scripture says everyone who accepts Christ gets the Holy Spirit, by the way. But she said, "I so wish you had the gift of the Holy Spirit that you had the Holy Spirit." And Carolyn would say, "But I do have the Holy Spirit." And our friend would say, "So you speak in tongues?" And Carolyn said, "No, I don't speak in tongues." And they did that same little routine any number of times. And they did it with smiles on their faces because she really did believe if you had the Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues. I don't believe that there's scriptural justification for that. I believe that's a mistake. And yet, uh, and, and the point is too that whatever happens in terms of the expression of the gifts, every believer in Jesus Christ who accepts him, the Holy Spirit enters them at that moment. We all have access to the Holy Spirit. The amount of control we give him in our life will make a difference in terms of how much the fruit of the Holy Spirit is reflected in us. But there are then later exceptional kinds of expressions that occur in the Holy Spirit, which may include speaking in tongues, or healing, or prophesying, or preaching or teaching, or 
you know, uh, gift of giving, you know, people who give extraordinarily. Um, that doesn't mean that somebody who, who doesn't speak in tongues, doesn't have the Holy Spirit, or doesn't do a particular thing, doesn't have the Spirit. We all have the Holy Spirit as part Amen. of our salvation. Terry. Amen. I just was wondering if, um, if we're talking about the Holy Spirit, um, if you could give some examples, one or two or more, of where people have heard the Holy Spirit or have spoken not of the, by themselves and not in tongues, but have spoken in, in English. Are you any experiences? Well, the happening? gift of prophecy. Um, no, today. I mean, today's no, no, I mean today. Okay. And again, prophecy doesn't mean telling the future. Yes. yes. When, when someone you. says, um, I have a word of the Lord. If you've ever heard that, I have a word, a word from the Lord for you. And, and to speak some truth. And sometimes it may not be qualified. It may not be qualified with that. It may be that someone um, in an administration meeting, a session meeting, or whatever, someone says, makes a, a, a statement. This is what God wants us to do. Okay. And there have been times when I very clearly had a sense that that was God speaking, which means that was the Holy Spirit speaking, because the Holy Spirit is uh, the part of God that communicates to and through us. And so whenever somebody speaks a word, whether they qualify it with thus saith the Lord or the Lord says to us or not, if we have a clear sense that that is God speaking to us, then that is the Holy Spirit speaking. Okay? Um, and again, prophecy doesn't mean telling the future. Prophecy is any time we speak the word of the Lord to the people, whether it is about something that's going to happen in the past or in the future, something that happened in the past, or more often, as people say, it's not so often foretelling, meaning future, but <clears throat> forthtelling, speaking to the situation right now. Marvin? It's been impressed on me this last week that uh, God has a, his agenda. He has a way and a time for doing things. And us in our eagerness as Christians, sometimes even with the influence of the Holy Spirit, feel we got to get this person saved now. we got to get this happen this way. And maybe we should spend a little more time saying, show me your way and your time, that I'm not butting heads with you. It's so back to the car. Please let the Holy Spirit drive, and I'm, I'm there to do my part to be faithful, but not to lead the charge. Yeah, our first prayer should always be, Lord, how should I pray? Yeah. What should I pray for? In the, at the beginning of the class, you were mentioning how there are churches that, that we have a tendency to never find balance. We, we have those churches that are very... Or just Christians individuals, too. So Word-oriented. Very word-oriented. Doctrinal-oriented, but they're so dry. You know, it's like uh, just a desert. And then you yeah. have the other side, which is so experientially oriented, and yet they're taken about by every wind of doctrine and just sail all over the place. Yeah. You know? When you look at Scripture, I find a great challenge in the contemporary church today is I don't know where it happened, I don't know how it happened, how we divided the two, but when you look at Scripture, they were never meant to be divided, word and spirit. No. They, were, they were meant to embrace one another, to complement one another, to edify the church. Right. And I think that's, for myself, in the ministry that I'm involved in, that is a great challenge that I find in the churches here, and I'm sure I'm finding in the United States, is to, is to unite together the hammer and fire, to bring together the Word and the Spirit in the balance that the Holy Spirit intended for it to be. Yeah, I, I agree. In fact, in our church, we, we don't, you know, we don't have the expression of the dramatic gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues and, you know, prophecy and things of that sort, unless, unless prophecy is simply the, you know, the spoken word. Uh, but it is certainly my hope that people, when they come to our church, get a sense of the heart. I mean, we have people in our church that, that greet everyone, everything up just short of licking their face, you know, in terms of welcoming, welcoming them. Uh, I think that's true. Is that not your experience? Okay. And so to me, that is the, you know, that is the subjective part. That's the relational part. And I've had people tell me they go to churches, uh, locally here even, and they walk in and there's one little old lady who will hand them, a, hand them a, bu a bulletin and not say a word. And that's the only sense they have of there being life there. And, you know, we don't, we're, as long as I'm around here, we're going to have more life than that. And God bless the people who make that possible in our church. But then we also are going to make sure we understand the propositional truths. You know, that when I preach and when we, uh, you know, we read, we read Scripture every week because we want to hear the Word of God read, Old Testament, New Testament, um, Gospel, and Psalms for, uh, Psalms or Proverbs for a responsive reading. We do that. 
because there is in those writings the propositional truth about God, you know, as well as it being, you know, moving. But uh, and we are going to, you know, we are always going to make sure that there is a doctrinal substance to what we have to say. But we do it in the context of being gathered. We say that every week. We gather to be brothers and sisters in the Lord, to be family uh, in Christ. Bob, we had a visit this week from <clears throat> some of our Pentecostal friends from Ohio. And, I heard about that. <laughs> yeah, one of them told me that the Holy Spirit spoke to him during the night and told him to tell me that if I didn't start reading the Bible, I was going to hell. And so I thanked them, and I told them I'd start reading it tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, always tomorrow. Um, yeah, whenever somebody says something like that, you have to say, as soon as the Lord tells me that. Well, anybody who says you're going to hell because you're not doing anything other than accepting Jesus Christ is wrong. I'm sorry. But it is acceptance of Jesus Christ, not reading the Bible or doing anything else, you know, that, that will make a difference in terms of our salvation. Okay.